Right, so I'm, I'm Isaac, you can call me Izzy if you want. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, making proofs uh, which are more convincing um, and making them more easily. Please interrupt. Uh, I'd like people to be able to jump in um, to interrupt me if uh, anything comes up, but unfortunately I can't really. Oh, okay, so now I have another computer next to me. Uh, okay, cool. So, so now, I can, now I can see things. All right, um, cool. So yeah, rules, uh, please interrupt me. Um, for questions or uh, clarification if it's needed. Um, uh, I guess people are muted, but I'm going to look at the chat. Um, and, uh, oh, so can't, someone says can't see you. Okay, everyone can see, okay. Uh, okay, so a brief external motivation um, is verifiable computation. I, I think probably most people don't need this, but uh, you know, just uh, for people who watch later or whatever, um, you want, to be able to have someone else do the work of a computation, um, but you want to be able to be confident in the result um, without having to redo the computation yourself. And so there's a bunch of cool examples um, uh, of applications. Um, one is for having private and auditable elections. Um, in the future, when, when these things are a lot more efficient, it, it will be nice to have cloud providers who can prove correct the results of computations that they perform as a service. Um, and another one that we're working on is doing blockchain compression. So Brad didn't mention, but the uh, cryptocurrency uh, that we're working on uh, has the property that um, storage space, I should say space and time required to verify the current state of the world is constant. Um, so it's wrapped up in, in one little snark. Um, so uh, just a bit of background on snarks. Um, uh, probably, again, no one needs it here, but for the video, um, a snark is a succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. Um, and what that means, essentially, is it's a short, easy to check proof for uh, statements of a particular form, statements of the form there exists, and moreover, I even know some data such that some property holds of that data, okay? Um, and then a little more specific background on R1CSs. Uh, an R1CS is a, a rank one constraint system. Um, so it, an R1CS will be over some fixed field, F. Um, and it's just a, a list of equations of the form. It's a list of so-called rank one constraints, where rank one constraint is just an equation of the form. Um, this some linear combination of variables xi times some lin other linear combination of, of the same variables is equal to some linear combination of those variables. Um, where where the, the, these linear combinations have coefficients in this field. Um, so uh, why do I even bring this up? Well, it's because there exists, and, and moreover, we even know, practical snark constructions for proving knowledge um, of satisfying assignments to rank one constraint systems over certain fields. Um, so uh, what that means is, is this is kind of a, this is kind of our compilation target if, if we're trying to, to make uh, uh, languages for specifying um, verifiable computations. Um, so yeah, so a bit about the sort of internal motivation. Um, I said something about why would someone want verifiable computation in the first place, but now I'm going to say something about why would someone want a better way to do verifiable computation. Um, specifying computations directly as constraint systems is, is kind of a, a bad idea for a number of reasons. It's error prone. Um, ironically, it's very hard to verify the correctness uh, of a constraint system against the kind of mental spec of a property that one wants to prove. Um, it's, it's not fun, um, just in, on, a, on a personal level. Um, and uh, it, having to do things as constraint systems makes abstraction and reuse very difficult. Um, it's basically all the same problems that you have just writing assembly by hand um, with writing constraint systems directly. So uh, one idea underlying this is uh, this idea that proof does not end at a proof system. This is the maybe uh, naive view or like the, the, the cryptographer's eye view, um, which is, uh, you write down a constraint system, a proof system turns that constraint system into a proof, like a snark, and uh, you have this informal proof uh, um, of the correctness of the system that's written you know, on ICR, uh, ePrint, website, and um, uh, that guarantees that uh, this cryptographic artifact is, is, in fact, proves the property that, that you wanted to prove. Um, so, uh, right, so, but, but really this is not where, proof doesn't end here. Well, or maybe I should say, uh, proof doesn't end here because there's kind of a hidden security assumption um, 
which is this constraint system directly correctly enforces the whatever property I happen to be interested in. Um, that is, there's no bugs uh, in my constraint system. Um, and uh, well, how plausible you think this assumption is, I guess, depends on how good a programmer um, you think wrote the constraint system. Um, so okay, so I said proof does not end a constraint system, but in fact, proof merely ends. A con sorry, proof doesn't end a proof system, but in fact, proof merely ends a proof system. Um, there's a whole bunch of things sort of prior to that. Um, so uh, it, at, at the beginning, there's there's just the high level spec. Um, this is the the mental the mental spec ultimately of the property that you want to prove. Um, then you write down that spec maybe in in a formal uh, language like Coq. Um, then what happens is uh, the programmer takes that spec and they turn it into some kind of encoding. I don't know what. By encoding, really, I mean program. Um, that could be uh, libsnark gadgets. That could be a Bellman uh, program. Could be a snarky program. Um, and here, the first thing that you do, either to yourself informally or formally, maybe with Coq or something, is uh, you produce a proof um, that this encoding that you wrote down uh, actually uh, complies with the high-level spec that you have in mind um, with respect to some chosen semantics for the encoding. Then what happens uh, is there's an interpretation step. So um, the encoding uh, gets somehow compiled into a constraint system, interpreted into a constraint system. Um, you know, in, in LibSnark, uh, this is very, uh, very apparent to the user. Um, in Snarky, it's, it's less so, um, but nonetheless, somehow a constraint system is produced. Uh, and uh, here, you want to have, again, some kind of proof, be it informal or formal, of the correctness of the interpreter, um, that somehow the constraint system produced respects the, the semantics that you had in mind while running down your, your encoding. Um, and then the process that we saw in the previous slide takes over. The constraint system uh, gets run through the proof system to produce a proof. Um, and uh, on the side, now you have to have a formal or informal proof of, of this correctness, you know, I soundness and completeness of, um, of this proof system. Uh, so all, you know, just this bottom part here doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't sort of guarantee the correctness of the proof. You need to have kind of this chain of, of reasons. Um, all the way up to, to, to your, your mental understanding of what's going on. So there needs to be a really a full, ideally, kind of full connection between what's happening in your brain and um, what happens uh, on the metal. Um, cool. So yeah, so with that in mind, um, our goal is going to be produce a high-level language which can be compiled or interpreted to produce rank one constraint systems. Um, you know, we have these great SNARK constructions for rank one constraint systems. We, we need some languages to make good use of it. Um, so that's, that's going to be our goal. So some desiderata that uh, uh, I would have in mind for such a language, um, one is programs in this language should be easy to check. Uh, and by that I mean now they should be easy to check against, you know, against our mental specs. Um, now with uh, our brains and with tests, um, and later in the future uh, with formal verification tools, so with Gawk or um, Lean or, or, or whatever you like. Um, and okay, so there's the with our brain and, and that's with the formal verification tools. Um, so uh, also things should still be efficient. You know, these, uh, these smart constructions are, are practical, but they're not the fastest thing in the world yet, so we still have to count constraints. Um, it, it's, any low-level constraint hacking uh, that you did before should still be possible. Um, that's an important uh, desideratum today. Um, and uh, finally, these things should be fun to use. So here, this is a bit of a pun. I mean fun in the sense of, you know, one should enjoy using them, but also fun in the sense of uh, functional programming. Um, uh, you should have type systems for correctness and for abstractions, um, and you should have some kind of compositionality of the language um, for code reuse and also for uh, writing modular compositional correctness groups, either formally or informally. Um, so uh, with those desiderata in mind, here's one proposal, um, which is our language Snarky, um, which is a language which uh, compiles into breakpoint constraint systems. Um, it's a simple functional programming language. Uh, in, in a nutshell, here's how I would describe it. 
It's uh, it's Hinley Milner um, with tuples, products, and some sort of subset types. These are just sort of general base programming conveniences. Um, and uh, then the, what, what you add on top of that uh, is a kind of request and handler system. This is kind of like an algebraic effect system. Um, and also, also assertions. So uh, we'll see exactly what I mean by both of these things. But these are for modeling the non-determinism. Um, and uh, so right, so this is, this is our base language. And here's kind of the effects that we add on top of uh, our base language. Um, right now, uh, this language, you know, this is sort of an ideal language, but it's implemented as an embedded DSL on the camel. Um, it's, you know, on our, on our GitHub uh, in that form. Um, uh, right now, in this talk, I, I want to focus on kind of the main programming language theoretic ideas um, of the language rather than giving a tutorial on using library. So I'm going to use an idealized syntax rather than the, the embedded DSL syntax. So this is the syntax that I, I wish I could write. And um, you know, maybe it, in a year or something, I, I can be writing. Um, cool. So right. So as I said, uh, the base language is, is kind of just Hinley Milner with tuples. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, OK, so you have functions. Um, so here's like the identity function. You know, this, this, you know, this represents the function x goes to x. Um, and you can do function application. So this is like f applied to an argument a. Um, you have let bindings. This is for you know holding onto the value uh, to an intermediate value of a computation and, and using it later. So you you can say oh let intermediate value be bound to the result of computation and do something else with that intermediate value. Oops. Um, uh, and then also you have tuples. This is like again kind of general programming convenience. Um, you can make tuples, okay? So pairs and triples and quadruples and all that. Um, and uh, you know, in reality, I guess actually in the embedded DSL, there's also records, but that's basically just tuples. So you know, in the sake of for the sake of parsimony, I, I'm, I guess I won't talk about that. Um, okay, so what's new? Okay, so what's new is this idea of a request. Um, I say new in the sense that it's on top of Hindley Milner. I don't say new in the sense of like this is a new idea. Um, so uh, the idea of a request is uh, it, it's very similar to, to throwing an exception. Um, the program is saying, uh, hey, I don't know what to do here. I'm sticking out my hand. Please, someone out there in the environment, put something in my hand, and, and I, I'm going to re resume execution uh, on that value. Um, it, it, it's, it's different than an exception in the sense that you know, when you throw an exception, you're sort of saying, hey, you know, I, I I throw up my hands. I don't know what I'm doing. Someone out there, please take over for me. Um, w w performing a request uh, it, it is you're merely pausing the computation um, with the intention of resuming it later after your handler has provided you with an appropriate value. Um, so uh, it, it's a uh, um, you know it's a it's it's a sort of generalization of of, uh, of exceptions. Um, in functional programming community, this is usually called like algebraic effects. It's like delimited continuations. If it's another thing that you're familiar with, I don't know. So, um, okay, cool. So, uh, the 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 this is how we, as I said, this is kind of how we model non-determinism. Um, the values provided by the environment are, in traditional parlance, kind of the the non-deterministic advice or or, or the witness. Um, so. Uh, Let's look at kind of the syntax um, for requests. Uh, here's how we declare requests. So for example, on line two here, um, here's a declaration of a request to find a SHA-256 preimage. And this says, find SHA-256 preimage is a request which, uh, given um, a, a bit string of length 256, expects to receive a bit string of length 512. Um, or we could declare uh, solve Sudoku is a request which given a Sudoku board, um, expects to receive a solution to that Sudoku board. Um, and uh, after making these declarations, we get some functions. So we get this function, find SHA-256 preimage, which is a function that takes uh, a bit string of length 256 and produces a request for a bit string of length 12. Um, and uh, all Sudoku is a function which, given a Sudoku board, produces a request for finding for for a solution to that board, um, and then we have a function for actually performing requests, oops, which um, just has type basically. Uh, uh, 
if, if I request for an A, I can produce an A. Okay. Um, so, okay, so once we have requests, uh, you have to have some way of answering the requests, and this is kind of the idea of a handler. So this is someone reaches out their hand, makes a request, a handler uh, puts, puts a block, uh, the value that's being requested into the hand. Um, so this is very similar to exception handlers. Um, the idea is uh, uh, the, the computation is asking for a value, so we need some way of, of putting that value in. Um, in pre-processing snark parlance, this is how we um, provide our auxiliary input um, to, the, to the computation. Uh, and then just the, the syntax for handlers, um, kind of similar to exception handlers, um, basically you say, okay, I'm going to handle this computation, and uh, if this computation makes a request for uh, a, a solving Sudoku puzzle, um, I'm going to respond by doing an exhaustive search uh, for a solution to that puzzle. Um, if the computation makes a request for finding a SHA-256 preimage to some hash, I'm going to respond with my secret value that, that H is a commitment to. Um, so, so this is how we kind of plug in uh, values uh, for the for the uh, the witness um, into the the non-deterministic sort of requests made by computations. Um, okay, and then finally, there's assertions, um, and this is just like assertions in any language. Uh, you assert some Boolean condition. Really, you have to assert some field element is equal to some other field element. Um, and you can just think uh, that the semantics here are basically execution of the program aborts if you assert false, okay, if you assert a condition with not true. Um, so uh, let's talk a bit about what one actually proves in this setting, what the, the proofs that one produces are proofs of. Um, normally, it, it's straightforward. You're, you create some kind of rank one constraint system and, and you prove knowledge of the satisfying assignment. Um, in, in this setting, it's going to be quite similar, but a phrased a little bit differently. Given a snarky program P, um, we want to be able to run it to produce a snark, which proves um, I know values of the appropriate types to answer all requests made by P so that P is able to execute with, without having an assertion failure. Um, so this is what we kind of want the semantics um, of, our, of our program to be in terms of what it proves. Um, so let's just do a little example to get, to, to get the idea across, because um, we haven't really seen an example yet. Um, let's make a start to prove the super contrived thing that actually, you know, if, if you're able to prove this, I would be super impressed. It's definitely impossible. I mean, I don't know any pre images of the L0 string, but let's say uh, we want to make a start that proves, um, I know a Shaw pre-image um, of the L0 string, which, if I consider it as an integer, uh, is divisible by three. Okay, sure, why not? Um, now, uh, according to our intended semantics, this is gonna be the same thing as saying, um, let's write a snarky program, P, such that uh, the above holds, if and only if, I can provide P with answers to its requests so that it can execute without an assertion failure. So we wanna devise some program such that it's uh, such that the possibility of providing answers to the request made by that program to make it execute without an assertion failure is the same thing as knowing a pre-image of the L0 string, which considered as an integer, is divisible by three. Okay, so um, here here's that example uh, in code. Um, let's say up here on line one, we define SHA-256 as being a function uh, from a 512 bit long string to a 256 bit long string. Um, we declare a request to find pre-image as before. Uh, it's a request which given a, a 256 bit string should produce a 512 bit string. You know, find me the pre-image please. Um, then we can define a function which finds the pre-image. Uh, how does that function work? You know, given a hash of length 256, it's gonna produce a bit string of length 512. Here's how it's gonna work. First, it requests please give me a pre-image to this hash. Then once it gets that, uh, that pre-image, purported pre-image X, it asserts that the SHA, you know, SHA on X is actually equal to the hash, and then it returns X. Okay, and the idea is if this function successfully uh, executes and returns a value, then you know, there was no assertion failure, and that means that uh, X, the return value, is indeed uh, a, a SHA pre-image to H. 
Okay, so we can kind of wrap up this idea of finding free image just very simply in a function. Um, and then let's suppose that <laughs> this would not be so fun to write, but let's suppose that uh, we wrote a function um, for checking that bit string of length 5 or 12 was divisible by 3 um, for, for just asserting that. So it's going to do some assertions, and it's just going to return unit. That unit, you know, if you're not familiar with this kind of functional programming lingo, this is kind of like void. So it, return, you know, it just makes some assertions, and it doesn't return anything. Um, and then at the end, we just, how, how do we encode our, our, our condition? We just say, OK, find free image on the all zero string. So that's like a function call. Uh, and then take the result and assert that that result is divisible by 3. OK, and that's, that's it. And so the idea here is uh, if this program is able to execute without an assertion failure, it would mean that we were able to produce an answer to this request so that uh, this assertion passed. And moreover, all the assertions in assert divisible by 3 passed on the result of that. Um, so it would be indeed proving what we, what we saw that to prove, which was um, I know a pre-image to the all zero string um, such that uh, that pre image is divisible by three when considered as an integer. Um, okay, cool. So, a bit of a contrived example. Of course, I don't know pre image to the all zero string, um, but uh, nonetheless, I think kind of gets the idea across and shows um, kind of how nice it is to be able to compose uh, functions um, just as if one were programming normally um, rather than you know, putzing around with constraints and gadgets and all that. Um, cool. So, uh, oh, and you know, just how we we would install a handler here, um, we could we could uh, handle this computation, um, which makes some requests uh, by saying, oh, if if uh, if this computation asks for pre image h, you should respond with the uh, my secret the value in my secret lookup table of shop pre images um, at h. Okay. Um, so that's kind of how you would use a handler in practice. Um, cool. OK, just a word about the semantics. Um, at a very high level, uh, there's sort of two, two semantics for any given Tanarchy program. Um, one is you can execute the program uh, to obtain a constraint system. And the other is you can execute a program to obtain an assignment to a constraint system along with the value. Um, and the idea here uh, is that in, you know, if, if you're using pre-processing uh, first you execute it once at the beginning of time to obtain a constraint system, then you hand that constraint system off to LibSnark or whatever um, to get your, your, your proving key and your, your verification key. Um, and then later, when someone wants to produce proofs, uh, they can execute their program according to the other semantics um, to produce an assignment to that constraint system. Um, and then hand that assignment off again to LibSnark um, to, to obtain a proof. Um, cool. Uh, OK. So uh, a word about efficiency. As I, I kind of mentioned before, this is one of the desideratas having good efficiency. Um, efficiency still matters, unfortunately. Um, you, need to, you, need to, you need to optimize the number of constraints. Um, as such, uh, you, you'd like it to be very easy to drop down to, to the lowest level of abstraction of just programming directly with constraints, um, and, and it should be easy to do that. Um, and, and it should sort of fit in nicely to the, to the overall language. Um, so uh, let's see how that's possible in Snarky just with a, a, a particular example. Um, I don't know who, in, who invented this, but OK. So uh, we want to produce a constraint system with the, the following property. Um, if we have variables x, y, and b, um, we want a, a rank one constraint system which enforces that b is a Boolean value, it's 0, 1, which, um, is, equal, which is equal to uh, sort of the equality test of x and y. So um, if x is equal to y, we want b to, as a field element, we want b to be equal to 1. And if x is not equal to y as a field element, um, we want uh, b to be equal to 0. So I'm not sure who this the particular constraint system is due to, but um, you know, uh, the, here's a constraint system uh, which enforces that that property. Um, it's very clever. Uh, it, thinking about it is tricky. You have to think through the cases and convince your, yourself actually that's what you should do. Um, but anyway, the, the, there there it is. Um, so uh, let's see how we can encode 
this sort of super low level constraint system and snarky and, and do so in a way um, that we sort of expose a clean external uh, interface. So um, here, here, here's how we do it. So uh, we declare these very boring requests, uh, this request field, which is just like, please give me some field element, I don't care. This request bool, which is, please just give me some boolean, I don't care. Um, and here's how we write the equal function um, for on x and y. First, we request some field element and call it inv. Then we request some boolean and call it result. And then we assert something. What do we assert? Well, those constraints from here, OK? So result times x minus y is equal to 0, and inv times x minus y is 1 minus result, OK? So which is, which is what we got here. Well, I permuted them, I guess. But um, so you assert that these that these relations hold amongst these two values and even result, and then you just return result. Um, and the super nice thing is uh, you totally encapsulate um, all this constraint hacking that you did under the covers. Um, externally, all anyone else knows is there's a function um, which takes two field elements and, and produces a boolean. Um, if you're the way that you do things in in, in libsnark or for example in the gadget lib is um, you have to sort of explicitly declare, uh, you know, I have two internal variables, inv and result, and, uh, you know, please fill them in. Please call generate witness on me later, um, and I'll fill them in. Um, but here, that's all kind of neatly wrapped up. Uh, and externally, you can just pretend I have a function that takes two field elements and produces a boolean. Um, and then uh, just here's like a pattern uh, that's useful, uh, which which is using handlers to kind of completely encapsulate things. So as I'd written it before, these requests for field elements uh, and Boolean go, go totally unanswered. No one is handling them. They're going to bubble up to the top level, and then someone at the top level will presumably have to answer them. That doesn't really make, you know, that doesn't really make sense. You want to kind of be, totally encapsulate um, the process of, of producing the witnesses, so to speak, um, to back these, these variables. Um, and so you can do that by just installing little handlers here. So I, I'd say, OK, I'm just going to request a field element as before, but I'm going to handle that in the following way. If this computation, which of course will request a field element, happens to request a field element, I'm going to return the following field element. If x is equal to y, then 0. Otherwise, the inverse of x minus y. OK? Similarly, uh, I can immediately handle uh, the result. Um, the result, the request for a Boolean result, which is just uh, if this computation request bool, request bool, um, I return uh, if x is equal to y, then field element one, otherwise field element zero. Um, and then uh, as before, I assert my constraints and I return the result. So now we have this function which you know has this external interface field error, field error bool, and actually it's sort of totally complete. So um, you can you can execute this uh, and it will fill in it will handle its own requests. It makes no requests uh, requests that that leak out. Um, so that's just kind of a common thing that you do is sort of immediately handling requests. Um, okay, so I, I I'm I'm coming coming on the end here. So let me just uh, talk about um, some uh, benefits of this approach in particular. Um, uh, so some are compositionality. This no cost abstraction, safety, and 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 verifiability. So, um, what do I mean with compositionality? So, this is like some. I first learned this word at this thing at the Simon's, this conference at the Simon Center a few years ago. I thought it was kind of a silly word at the time, but um, I, I think it actually is kind of a good word. And and compositionality basically means um, uh, a system is compositional if there are some properties which are. If there's first of all some kind of means of combining objects of that system, uh, and moreover, there are some guarantees about properties being preserved when you combine those objects in the prescribed ways. Um, so, that, of course, that's a very high level vague notion, but let me try and make it a little concrete. So, uh, we just have functions here. We don't we don't have um, gadgets or something which are compositional in their own way, but um, we just have functions which have sort of a very simple notion of composition. You can apply them. Um, the compositionality makes it possible to, to not have to sort of declare witnesses explicitly. You just provide them um, as the need arises. Um, and uh, the most important kind of compositional thing here is um, the, the semantics are compositional. So uh, a function, a snarky function, 
can sort of be interpreted as a function, just a regular function. Um, and you know, given semantics is a regular function. Um, and, and what that means is uh, when the time comes to uh, open up Kopf and, and start formally specifying these things, um, correctness proofs, compositional correctness proofs will be possible and, and they'll be somewhat straightforward. And what do I mean by composition, compositional correctness proofs? Well, you'll be able to write a proof that proves the correctness of a, of a particular little function, say the equals function. Um, you'll be able to prove this snarky equal program actually implements the spec of the external equality function for fields. Um, so, uh, uh, and then every time that you use the equals function, it's not that you have to redo the proof that this set of constraints implements, oh, this field element is equal to this one. You can just reuse the proof, the single proof that you wrote for the, for the equality function itself um, at each invocation of the function. And this is possible because the, the semantics are compositional, um, because the semantics are respected by composition. Um, it, it's not possible in a world where your semantics are not compositional, for example, uh, this runs some C++ code, which is like the semantics um, afforded to you by, you know, I mean, of course, in reality, you know, say like in LibSmart gadgets, of course, in reality, uh, uh, one would argue that, oh, you know, uh, LibSmart gadgets are actually a restricted dialect of C++ where we make sure to do the things such that they have compositional semantics, but, um, it, you know, uh, th there's nothing enforcing that except for uh, reading the code itself. Um, so, uh, right, so this is something I just touched on, this kind of concept of, of no or very low cost abstraction. Um, you, can, you can have efficiency without sacrificing compositionality, clean compositionality. Um, you can do your constraint hacking under the covers and uh, no one has to know about it. You can expose a very clean interface that looks like you're just dealing with a normal function um, rather than something that uses some non-determinism under the hood and does some constraints and so on. Um, uh, another benefit of, of having type system is types are, are helpful for enforcing correctness. So, for example, you can have types for this is a Boolean or this is a point on a specified elliptic curve. Um, which, which there's not really a clean way to do, um, say, in, in Lipstar Gadget. But I only say Lipstar Gadget because it's the only other system really I have any experience using. Um, so, of course, this helps uh, in writing correct snarks. Um, as I said, you know, in Lipsnark, Booleans are, are just normal field element variables that hopefully at some point we're constrained to be Boolean. Um, uh, right, so another benefit, which is kind of the, the, the thing that we set out to do in the beginning, is, is having these things easier to believe, so more, more verifiable. Um, there's a few reasons that, that I think this is the case with snarky programs. One is high level, high level code is a lot easier to check. Um, the, fewer, the fewer lines there are, the closer uh, those lines are to your mental concepts, the, the easier is it, it is to believe that, um, that, that they're doing what, what you expect them to be doing. Um, and another thing which is nice is about the handler system in particular, um, so that's kind of a general thing about high-level code, right? But in particular, having a handler system um, means you can sort of partially test soundness um, with so-called, you know, malicious handlers. So you can try and stuff stuff in bad values and, uh, you know, values that you don't expect to make the constraints satisfy uh, and see if they do. Um, and so here you can you can gain some more, uh, uh, What's the word? Belief in the correctness of your constraints, or in the in in the soundness of your constraints, um, right? And so, as I said, eventually um, it, it should be straightforward. I mean, there's at least a, a clear path to writing compositional correctness proofs in some some system like Pop or or you know Agda or Lean or whatever you like. Um, okay, so uh, that, that's that's pretty much it for me. Um, I, I, you know, I debated with myself, do I want to put typing rules in this talk? Ultimately, I decided that it, maybe the people who would understand the typing rules uh, could have derived them for themselves anyway, so, uh, you know, not, not, really, uh, not really worth it. So anyway, ask me if you want typing rules. If you want to go implement the nice syntax um, with those typing rules, I'd be very happy. Um, uh, the code and the library is on GitHub um, at this link. Um, you know, O1 lab slash turkey.
Um, and oh yeah, also, you know, I think I just want to say like, I think there is a real opportunity here. The, SNARKs are, you know, writing verifiable computation, programming languages for, for verifiable computation is not a domain where there's any kind of remotely dominant presence. Um, uh, unlike, you know, regular programming languages or even now smart contracts programming languages where there's a somewhat dominant player, um, which means there's still an opportunity to, to, to make things uh, not suck. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, we should try and do that. I guess, um, and uh, yeah. So you know, with that, um, I'm happy to to open up to any questions that, that people have. Um, yeah. Hi, Isaac. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I had a question about the type signatures of those encapsulated versus unencapsulated functions. Um, it looked like the types of those two functions were the same, whether they would make uh, external requests or not. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, so this effect system is, uh, you know, as people say, unchecked. Um, so there, there's like, I guess, kind of, you know, this is kind of a choice. Um, you, you can you can either track the the requests made by um, your uh, your functions in the type signature or not. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess I, I I did it this way because. Um, it, it was easier to, and more ergonomic as an embedded DSL. In uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have strong opinions. I have very strong opinions on the trade-offs between uh, exposing the the sort of open requests uh, and, and not. But yeah, does that kind of answer your okay. question? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's some deeper uh, motivation there that I was missing, but that answer makes sense. Oh, Thanks. okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, so well, um, that was a great presentation. Uh, thanks, thanks yeah. for doing this. It was very interesting. Oh, my yeah, pleasure. Right. Thank you so much. It's really, uh, uh, I really like this work, and I appreciate the presentation in this format. That's really helpful. I have a whole bunch of questions, but they all kind of take the form of, um, oh, here's an extra feature I would like. Can I have it? And that's not uh, too fair to um, do, but um, uh, maybe just to do one of those. Um, what kind of um, some of the other uh, SNARK languages, uh, or at least SNARK front-end compilers, especially Pinocchio and Geppetto, and I think JSNARK to some lesser extent, try to do uh, compiler optimizations in the back end. And so I wonder what you could say about the like performance, like the size of the circuits that you get from this if um, using it embedded in, like, can you apply OCaml compile uh, optimizers and therefore get optimized circuits, or is that the wrong way to look at it? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess like, uh, you know, the, the semantics are, are like pretty, you know, how how one of these th programs kind of compiles into constraint systems is relatively straightforward. It it uh, you can it's just adding some constraints, right? Um, every time you call a cert. Um, so uh, I, I currently I, I don't do any fancy optimizations, um, but you know the AST is uh, available to you, so you you can. Um, so so one one for example that I, I would like to do. Um, that I haven't implemented yet is uh, I, I actually special case equality constraints. So so saying just this thing is equal to that thing rather than like an R one CS which is like which is like this times one is equal to that. Um, so if you wanted you you know <laughs> and I want to <laughs> um, you could write a pass uh, which which uses those equality constraints to unify variables for example um, and and make it so that you, you don't pay any more. Uh, so, so right now it's like the the libsnark gadget lib style is like you, you pass in the return variable that you want the result of the computation to like be equal to, um, and then it sets up constraints which like assert that that, that that's the case. Um, a nicer style is for the a more compositional style is for the uh, a computation to return a value and then for you to assert that that value is equal to the expected one. Um, but you know you pay an extra constraint there um, if you're asserting inequality. So. It, it would it would be nice to have a unifier that goes in and takes the constraint system and, and contracts uh, these equality constraints. I mean that's totally something you know you could do or I could do, um, but I, ha I haven't implemented that yet. Um, and yeah, does that kind of answer your question? Oh, also um, th there are a few cases where um, 
where because you're sort of just dealing with functions, it's very easy to to uh, kind of special case things. So for example, um, you know, computing a conjunction. Um, let's take the example of computing like a conjunction of a bunch of bools. Uh, if you have two bools, the best thing to do is to do one multiplication. It takes one constraint. Um, but if you have if you have more more than two bools, okay. Well, the naive thing is is to kind of like pairwise, uh, you know, kind of multiply uh, down the list, um, and that that would take you know n constraints or whatever. But uh, there's a better thing you can do, which is take take the bools as lists, sum them up, and uh, check the equality of, of that sum with uh, you know the length of the list. Um, which just will cost you two constraints. Um, so uh, it's it's easy to write functions that that do this special casing um, inside of them. So like in you can look in Snarky on GitHub. Uh, ooh, at least in the internal version. I don't know if we moved this patch onto the external version yet. Um, the the conjunction function matches on the length of the list that it's provided, and uh, you know does the does the appropriate thing. Um, so you can kind of write your optimizations. Sort of uh, in line, somewhat. If that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, l l let me follow up with a related question, which is just: I, I wonder if this um, space of snark front end compilers uh, is mature enough that you could have meaningful benchmarks uh, between them. So, for example, um, uh, like a SHA two fifty six gadget, the, the handwritten one in lib snark may be compared with um, you know the shortest one that you can do in uh, snarky. Oh, oh, right. So, so the shortest one that you can do in Snarky is the same as the one that you can do in LibSnark. Um, you, you, you just you just do it in, in like very you know low level style underneath the covers. Um, it, I think it will probably look a little nicer, but um, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. You, you, you can do all the same constraint stuff that you would do normally, but um, ex then expose a functional interface. Does that? Yeah. Anyway, if there are any other questions. Um, Izzy, do you mind like uh, like if people sent uh, further follow ups uh, after watching the presentation, uh, if they just emailed on the the ZF's working group list? Yeah, just de to follow de up? definitely, definitely, that would be great. I'll, I'll you know I'll respond to that. Awesome, thank you, thank you so much for your time or presenting to um, to everybody here, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, thank I, you. I hope, yeah, yeah. The thanks, thanks, thanks to O One Labs. Really appreciate it. Um, and and hope to see them and a bunch of you at uh, at Zcon Zero to talk about uh, more more of this exciting exciting stuff. Yeah, thanks so much, Josh. It was a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Take care, all.